Are you ever in the middle of playing something scary and suddenly ask yourself, why am I doing this? That usually happens to me right about here. I get hit with that awful get me out of here feeling, but I keep going. Why? That's what I want to talk about today. In the last five years, there's been a lot of growth for the horror genre in all directions. There's been innovation in writing like Soma's heady existential dread, which was even scarier than the in-game monsters. Boy, it's me, Carl. Carl Semke. Graphics and horror have refined across the board to frighten us with gore and two realistic-looking creatures. And truly terrifying AI have been born, like the xenomorph in Alien Isolation, which was designed to be maybe a little too smart. Even indie developers have risen to the top because of their scary creations. Go to a mall or a game store and it isn't a surprise anymore to see a lot of merchandise from horror games. Right now horror is a thriving genre for the video game industry, but why is it so popular? Media psychologists, researchers who specialize in figuring out why we like the media we do, have called the strange widespread adoration of horror media the horror paradox. What's perhaps the most basic and fundamental theory in the field of media psychology is called mood management theory. It suggests that individuals will select media content they expect will improve their mood. In other words, we pick games that we think will put us in good moods and give us good feelings. But do we play Soma in a good mood? Does it feel great to get caught and killed by the xenomorph or spend 10 minutes hiding from it under a table? Not really. But let's explore some promising theories that could explain the paradox of why we keep coming back to horror for more pleasurable discomfort. True to the purpose of screen therapy, let's dive into the possible ways playing horror games can improve our well-being, such as how it can bolster our emotional resilience, help us recover from trauma, and feed some of our fundamental psychological needs. First up, Threat Simulation Theory. First, a simulated threat appears. Then there's the first emotional reaction. Panic sets in and your adrenaline spikes as fight or flight responses rev up. This isn't a great feeling and you're immediately motivated to end the stress before it gets worse. You try to neutralize a threat. It's a gamble whether or not it pays off, causing the tension to build a little more. In this case, it worked. The threat is dismissed momentarily and the tension drops, leaving you a floaty feeling as the adrenaline wears off. But what's addictive isn't the adrenaline, it's the newfound sense of mastery and control. You now feel stronger and more confident in handling threatening situations. This is a highly positive feeling, and according to threat simulation theory, this is what we keep coming back for. Of course, it might not last long until the process repeats. This theory argues that we like horror games because although it doesn't feel great at first, eventually, if we stick to it, we get good enough at coping with threats that we gain the skills needed to win. And this is a great feeling. It feeds our sense of control and our positive mood. On a deeper level, there are actual psychological benefits of going through these feelings over and over again. When we're exposing ourselves to the negative emotions of horror, while we're actually in a safe environment, we're practicing emotional resilience. Emotional resilience is what psychologists call our confidence that we can safely and quickly bounce back from negative emotions. The more we believe we can handle negative feelings, the easier it is to handle them. The less confident we are, the more we fear feeling bad, and the more squeamish or avoidant we become. But it's important to know that emotional resilience is a skill, and it can be strengthened with practice. And what better way to practice than in a safe space using a game you can shut off at any time? The game called Nevermind, which was developed by Flying Mollusk, is a horror puzzle game that uses biofeedback tech to listen to its player's heart rate. It was designed to monitor stress levels, and the more a player gets scared, the harder it gets. This sounds mean, but this is a mindfulness training technique, and it is balanced by a twin mechanic. If you can keep your cool and calm yourself down, then the game gets easier. This motivates players to monitor and regulate their emotions consciously, which is a very difficult but infinitely useful skill. Flying Mollusk aims to work with professionals to use this game and others like it as a therapy tool for people with anxiety, stress, or even PTSD. 
by making the players mindful of their stress levels and helping them practice coping with doses of controlled fear, they hope to help players become more resilient in real life. Lastly, self-determination theory. This theory says we have three basic psychological needs that regulate our emotional well-being. We look to fulfill these needs not only in real life, but also in our media choices. These three needs are competence, autonomy, and relatedness. But today I'm just talking about these two. Competence. This is actually another name for the control we talked about with threat simulation theory, which then only leaves us relatedness. This is surprisingly important for horror. In short, it's our need to feel meaningfully connected to others. We tend to play or watch horror in a social context. Although the subject of horror is the exact opposite of connection, party horror games help us feel connected to others, even if they're ghoulish or campy. We laugh at ourselves and our fears more easily when playing with others. The panic and adrenaline gives way to laughing and jokes, increasing fun. Research has shown that this is even true for when we watch YouTubers play horror games. Audiences engage in social sharing, the act of sharing reactions to media with others to validate and cope with our emotions and to feel more similar to others. Let's Player audiences can actually feel the positive rewards of connection and relatedness without even participating in the game. But that's the theory of parasocial relationships, which is a whole other video by itself. In conclusion, horror games are constantly putting us through negative feelings and making us scared or angry, but at the heart of horror games is the idea of fun. Games encourage us to overcome fear and stay focused and have fun beating the level. This could be great practice for staying focused in real life and not getting too caught up in fear or anger in our day-to-day -day lives. We also have opportunities to share our experiences and relate with others. Despite these positive effects, we can't forget the troubling research that suggests excessive playing of horror games can lead to desensitization towards violence and the perpetualization of negative stereotypes. It's all about balance. And like we saw with Nevermind, the key is mindfulness. The more mindfully we play, the more we get out of our experiences with not only horror games, but all of our media encounters. If we take time to reflect on the emotions media evokes from us, the more we stand to learn about ourselves and our needs. Thanks for watching. I'm hoping to upload more to this channel in discussing what positive psychological effects there are to gain when we mindfully engage with our games, movies, and internet content, and how to use them to bolster our emotional intelligence. Until next time, happy playing.